Hey guys, welcome back to another tutorial video. This one is going to be about how to fly in Planetside 2, and I'll be going in depth with how I explain the maneuvers and in-game physics of flying, which is why this video might be a little bit long. I'll leave some timestamps for you in the description of this video so that you can skip to where you're having trouble, but I highly, highly recommend that you watch the full video because you might have the cause of your troubles identified, but you're looking for the wrong solution. I will also try to explain a lot of what we do as pilots, so that it makes sense instead of just saying, this is what we do. We'll be talking about settings, keybinds, flight mechanics, and other things. I've been debating on whether or not to make this video, or a different kind of video on a different topic for a while, but after getting so many questions about flying on my Twitch stream, which I'll link in the description, I've decided to make this video because of how many people were asking, as well as for the players looking around for the right explanation of what to do. Also, this video will be about how to fly in terms of air-to-air -air combat, more specifically, ESF versus ESF combat. This will not be a video about how to ground farm, fly a lib, or fly a galaxy. So with that being said, and this video being so long, let's get started. Alright, let's get started with the very basics, your settings. You should always start with everything lower off to get the best frame rate you can when flying. That is to say, if your PC can handle medium or ultra graphics with no problem, then go for it. Flying with ultra settings is really immersive and it looks very nice. However, the only two things that you really need to adjust for flying are your render distance and your particles. Your render distance should be set at 1600 to 1700 and nothing more. The reason being is that vehicles, or more specifically ESFs, will render out to this range at max. There is no reason to be flying with anything more than this. The second setting, particles, allows you to actually see your tracers out to a greater range for better tracking capabilities. The setting should be set to either high or ultra. When you change your particle settings, the game will say that they will come into effect when you have restarted. You can just ignore this, however. Particles get changed in-game instantly, so don't worry about having to relog. You need to log into Planicide 2 with your particles set to low, though, first. If you log in with your particles set to ultra or high already, with low settings, they may appear smaller and harder to see. Make sure when you log out, you set your particles back to low so that when you log back in, you have the exact same settings that you were at before. I've noticed that doing this will make your tracers appear just a bit bigger and more defined, allowing you to better track what you're aiming at. This only applies if all your settings are low, though. So if you have your overall graphics set to high or ultra, then don't worry about this problem. And that's all you really need for your graphics settings. Pretty simple, right? Let's move on then. Now that your settings are figured out, let's go to keybinds and I'll start with the most important one first, which is going to be your analog throttle. This one is really important because of its function and how it can help out newer pilots and still helps veteran pilots. Analog throttle will, when pressed, allow the player to slow to a hover as fast as possible and stay there. I recommend binding this to something easy to press, which is why I have mine bound to S. I've heard of people binding it to X and C sometimes, so don't be afraid to find something that is comfortable for you. Now with analog throttle comes a danger. If you try to land with analog throttle, you'll notice that your ESF will only hover and this can be a problem for a lot of people. The reason it does this is because the throttle will automatically try to keep the ESF off the ground when in hover, and it will stay on even if you exit the vehicle. To fix this, all you have to do is tap your throttle up key, which in my case, and in most cases, is W. This will cancel the throttle so that you can land safely. Another important thing to do when flying is to zoom your minimap out all the way. You can find the keybinds for this under the General tab near the bottom. This will make keeping track of spotted targets a lot easier when flying. Moving on to some more complicated keybinds. Pitch up, pitch down, roll right, and roll left. I wouldn't recommend trying to bind these keys for newer pilots, only because they can be very confusing wherever you decide to put them. Even I had trouble with my keybinds when I first got them set up after flying for a very long time. However, if you want to do it, then here's how you can. If you have two mouse buttons properly set up, you can bind your pitch up and pitch down to them. Pitch is very, very important when flying in air-to-air -air combat, and I'll explain why later in the video. For now, put your pitch up and your pitch down on your two thumb buttons. 
if you don't have two thumb buttons, you can always put them on Q and E if you wish. Make sure to rebind those keys if you decide to do that though. The roll keys are optional in my opinion. You don't really need them, but it helps if you have a lower flight sensitivity, which I'll discuss later in the video. If you do decide to bind them, make sure you have enough keys to do so and in comfortable positions. If you bind your pitch up and pitch down to your mouse buttons, maybe set Q and E to your roll keys. Remember, whatever you set up for yourself you will have to adjust to, so make sure to allow yourself some time to get comfortable with your own setup before you start thinking that it won't work or that it is too hard to get used to. Of course, we can't forget about the actual setup and what you'll be using on your ESF, can we? Pretty much every pilot uses the exact same setup for every ESF, so don't worry about what faction you play on. The main class setup for every ESF will be as follows. Your main gun will be the default gun for each faction. That's right, I said the default guns. The M18 Needler for the TR, the M20 Mustang for the NC, and the Saron Laser Cannon for the VS. These nose guns have the best DPS for your average dogfight. Pair that with the fact that they are the most accurate and have one of the highest velocities, and you've got yourself a well-rounded nose gun to deal with every situation. You'll be running extended magazine on all of these regardless of faction because of the higher damage per magazine and the fact that they already have a fast reload time. You'll also want to max out your ammo capacity. Getting an optic on these weapons is optional. I personally prefer a 1.25 zoom optic on mine. The primary reason every pilot uses their nose guns is because it provides the fastest and most effective way of killing another ESF. If you watch this demonstration, you can see that I kill my buddy Quinn before he has any time to fire an A to A missile. Thank you Quinn for helping me by the way. Now this isn't a realistic demonstration. With very few exceptions, you're not going to have 100% accuracy in an actual dogfight. The point of the demonstration is to make you aware of the damage potential of the nose gun itself and to show you that the A to A missiles, as well as the coyotes in this separate demonstration, only do a limited amount of damage compared to the nose gun. They are used to get guaranteed damage on a target, not as a primary weapon, hence why they are placed under the secondary weapon category. To get the most out of the ESF in terms of air-to-air -air combat, you will need to use your primary nose gun. Moving on, the next thing you'll want is fire suppression. The reason you want to run this and not flares is because you won't be taking any ground missiles when you're flying really high, and flares will only block one barrage of A to A missiles, or coyotes, which don't do that much damage to an ESF anyway. The other reason is because of how good the ESF fire suppression system actually is. Other vehicles will only allow you to repair up to 12% of their total HP. The ESF allows you to repair up to 25%. 25%. And it's even more than that when you include the fact that it will instantly take you out of fire or the red zone. So if you time it right, you can repair more than 30% of your ESF with one button. The other thing is you will be mostly taking damage from flak, and flares can't do anything against that. The ESF is fragile as it is, so always run fire suppression. The next thing you want to run is either stealth or nanite auto repair. Stealth will allow you to hide from the passive engagement radar given to every ESF and will help you get the jump on people. Nanite Auto Repair is more for survivors, the people who know how to manage their HP and can handle ESFs knowing where they are and jumping them. This is not to say that Nanite Auto Repair is for people that are of higher skill level. It's more saying you can accept the fact that you will be on everybody's radar and that you're okay with that. The plus side of it is that you will be almost always at full HP when not in combat. The next thing you'll want is hover stability. The reason being is because you will be hover dueling frequently and hover stability increases your air break effectiveness which will get you into hover mode more quickly which we'll be talking about in a few minutes and it also increases your vertical thrust power when you are in hover. Every pilot uses this airframe in a hover duel. There are no exceptions. Maxing out this airframe will give you a great edge in terms of hover dueling potential. Racer Chassis is used for a playstyle more similar to familiar games, such as Battlefield and other games with quote-unquote normal flight mechanics, 
where you are only able to fly forwards. Enough about those other peasant games though. We're here to learn how to fly in the better game, Planetside 2. So let's get into what mechanics make flying in this game so special and unique. The bread and butter of what makes Planetside 2's air gameplay so unique are the physics of it and the extensive amount of freedom of what you can do in the air. Do you want to pull a platoon full of galaxies and liberators? Go for it. You want to pull a platoon of ESFs and dominate the air? Why not? You want to get better at piloting because it looks amazing and stylish as hell? Well, that's what we're here to learn, so you're in luck. This will probably be the longest section in the video, so just bear with me. We'll be covering everything from how to turn and face your enemy, to how to reverse maneuver, so let's get straight into it. To start with, let me give credit where credit is due. I'll be showing you guys some images to help you understand flight mechanics and controls in Planetside 2. I have pulled all of these images from Hater's ESF Top Gun Guide which I will link in the description of this video, and I highly recommend you check it out and give it a good read. He also has some extra videos to look at as well, so be sure to check those out. So, let's get to know the basics of an ESF. I'm sure you are all aware of the fact that an ESF is a mix between a helicopter and a fighter jet. It can perform the same hovering maneuvers that a helicopter can, and it can also fly like a fighter jet. Simple, right? Well, let's move on and show a little bit more of the complexities. Flying in Planetside 2 has everything you'd expect when it comes to your typical flight controls. You have your yaw, pitch, and roll all there, so what seems so confusing? In most flying games, your yaw will be on your mouse, and your roll will be on your A and D keys. However, as you can see from the image, this is not the case. Your A and D keys will be your yaw, and your roll and pitch will be on the mouse. This is, in my opinion, something minor to get used to. If you've played a lot of other flying games, then it's understandable that you might have trouble getting used to this. The good thing is that W and S are still your standard go forward and slow down keys, so that should be pretty familiar. Here's where things start to get weird and really confusing for most people. I will be doing in-game demonstrations of these things as I explain this image so you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Switching to hover mode and switching to jet mode. If you've tried flying, chances are you've struggled trying to understand this, and that's perfectly understandable. Do you guys remember how I said that pitch is very important when I was talking about keybinds? Well, time to reiterate. Pitch is very important, and I think you can see a little bit why just by looking at this image. When you want to switch to hover mode, you will need to either, number one, ascend and pitch down, Or number two, descend and pitch up. You can find your ascend and descend buttons in your keybinds. By default, they are spacebar and left control respectively. We'll also be referencing these maneuvers by using number one and number two respectively. Please note that when we talk about ascending and descending, we are talking about the vertical thrust on the Y axis, specifically meant to move your ESF up and down. Every single great pilot has mastered how to do this, and I cannot stress this enough when I say that you need to learn to be able to get into hover mode quickly and effectively in order to be able to put up a good fight against anybody, regardless of their skill level and your skill level. You will use the number one maneuver, I'd say, probably 90% or more in your engagements. The number two maneuver, or descending and pitching up, will be used in specific situations where it is not efficient to use the number one method. Pitching down is the most effective and efficient in terms of getting you into hover, regardless of your ESF's position or orientation in the air. Never forget that. This video is really long as it is. So I will just say that you will eventually know what situations to use the number two method in when they appear before you, and you will know only by the experience that you've acquired. Make sure to practice the number one method extensively to help you improve your performance against anybody and everybody. So, 
How do I know that I'm in hover mode, you might ask? There are two ways available to the Mosquito and the Reaver, but really only one for the Scythe. The Mosquito and the Reaver both have thrusters that will change to the downward position when you are in hover mode, so if you're in third person you can watch them change position. The Scythe has static thrusters, meaning that they will not change their position relative to the mode that your aircraft is in. You will have to get used to the timing of getting into hover mode when you want to do this third person method with the Scythe. The second way to see if you are in hover, which is also available to every ESF, is to look for the H on your cockpit's HUD. When the H is showing, this means that you are in hover mode. Pretty straightforward. Okay, now that we've talked about that, let's get to the one thing that a lot of people are here for. The reverse maneuver. Did you notice anything similar between the reverse maneuver and the number one method for switching into hover mode? Well, you should have because they are the exact same maneuver. Seriously. The one thing that you need to remember is that the reverse maneuver will only, and I mean only work, when you are ascending and pitching down while in hover mode. Pitching down plays the critical role here. If you are pitching down with your aircraft in hover mode, you can continuously do a reverse maneuver. Theoretically, if you had infinite afterburner fuel, you could perform a continuous reverse maneuver as long as you are pitching down. A quick side note, this is why I didn't talk about a secondary weapon when I was going through the loadout of the ESF and why I've decided to say what I'm about to in this section. Most of the pilots you will see run afterburner pods for the extra chances to do a reverse maneuver in a duel, and this can be well worth it if you know how to use it. And that's pretty much it. That's really all there is to doing a reverse maneuver. A lot of people make it seem like it's a really hard maneuver to pull off but once you understand the mechanics of it, it's actually really, really simple. Moving on from there, and continuing with the images, switching to jet mode involves the exact opposite of switching to hover mode. If you want to switch into jet mode, you can either ascend and pitch up, or descend and pitch down. For the sake of efficiency, let's call these maneuvers number 3 and number 4 respectively. This maneuver will often be used to help you reposition in a fight where your opponent least expects it. However, you may be an easy target for more experienced pilots when you do this, so be careful. You will most likely use the number 3 method probably 99% of the time. I have yet to see the number 4 method applied in combat. Another thing to point out is that most newer pilots will accidentally go into jet mode when they don't want to, and this will also make them an easy target for more experienced pilots. As I said before, practice switching into hover mode via the techniques we just talked about, and this problem will likely disappear by itself. Now for a quick segment on the effect that gravity has on your ESF, and this should wrap up this section of the video. Gravity will affect your ESF in three ways. You will either be accelerated by it, reversed by it, or neutral to it. I'll explain these via a demonstration. Being accelerated by gravity means that, when looking or pitching downwards with your ESF, gravity will be pulling down, simulating the effect of going forwards in your ESF. This is why you will end up falling out of hover if you are looking down for too long, hence why the thrusters point back instead of down. The opposite effect, reversed, is when your ESF is pointing, or pitching, upwards. Gravity will then be pulling down on the back of your aircraft, which will simulate a reverse maneuver. This is why when you are pitching up and falling, your ESF will stay in hover mode and you can execute a reverse maneuver without having to pitch down for a short period. I will talk more about this and how this applies in a dogfight later in the video, so we'll come back to it. This section was quite long, but I hope you guys learned something from it. Think of these as the basics of what you need to begin hover dueling and practice everything here so you can improve your skills. And now, time to move on. Next up is your flight sensitivity. Infantry players talk a lot about sensitivity. It can either be high, low, or somewhere slightly in between. Whatever sensitivity you choose, you can get good with. It's just a matter of sticking with it. If you don't like a certain sensitivity, you can always switch to something more comfortable. Here's the problem with trying to tell you what sensitivity you should choose. I can't. I can't just simply say, pick this sensitivity or pick this other sensitivity. If it were that easy, everyone would have the exact same sensitivity, and we would be done with this section. 
I can only tell you about the advantages and disadvantages of both, because some people might prefer one over the other. So, by all means, start out with something that is comfortable for you. If you think you need to increase your sensitivity, go for it. If you think you should decrease your sensitivity, go for it. Just make sure you find a good sensitivity for yourself and stick with it. Alright, let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages. But first, I need to tell you guys about some forced options that the ESF has. These are options that are supposed to be optional, as the name implies, one is even optional to infantry, but are forced into the aircraft itself. These are mouse acceleration and smoothing. The reason I didn't include these in the flight mechanics portion of the video is because of the fact that they are forced options. The reverse maneuver is a mechanic, not a forced option. Same goes with the vertical thrust and so on. Anyway, mouse acceleration, in short, is a feature that makes it so that if you move your mouse the same distance twice, but with different speeds, your cursor will end up in two different places. The other would be smoothing. This means that if you stop moving your mouse, the cursor will just slow down and not stop immediately. Both of these are immensely detrimental when it comes to trying to aim in an ESF and even more to newer pilots who aren't used to these features at all. Keep in mind that these features were not always standard on aircraft. Before the PS4 version of Planetside, the ESF didn't have either of these. I'm not here to spout personal opinions on this, so let's just move on to the actual explanation of the sensitivities. The advantage of having higher sensitivity is that it will allow you to easily get out of the dead zone, which is a term more associated with console controllers. If you don't know what this term means, think of it as the place where you stop moving your mouse and then begin moving it again. Higher sensitivity will allow you to help negate the effect of mouse acceleration as well, although your tracking capabilities might suffer because of the quicker movements. On the other hand, a lower sensitivity is used for better tracking because of the slower and more smooth movements. The setback, obviously, is that it will be harder to break the mouse acceleration, which can impact your quicker movements more. So, in short summary, higher sensitivity allows for faster adjustments and less impact from mouse acceleration with less tracking effectiveness. Lower sensitivity has high tracking effectiveness with a harder time making quick, jerky movements. As a side note, some people like higher sensitivities just because they don't have to move their mouse as much to perform some complicated maneuvers that the ESF can do. Lower sensitivities will have to rely on keybinds due to the lack of mouse space available to some people. Well, that was pretty short, wasn't it? Remember, just like we said with your keybinds, you need to get used to your sensitivity for it to work. You can't just change your sensitivity to something ridiculously outside of what is comfortable for you and expect everything to go perfectly. Make sure you spend time with one sensitivity that you feel comfortable with and see what adjustments you can make from there. Dogfighting will become a lot easier when you can actually aim at your target instead of wildly flinging your mouse around. Speaking of which, dogfighting is our next subject. Now that you have everything set up, it's time to jump into some basic dogfighting strategies. So let's get to it. One thing that I want to say about this section before we actually dive into it is that 1. You will see incremental improvement overall, but maybe not immediate improvement. And number 2. You have to keep going and taking engagements even if you are not doing as well as you would like to, but don't burn yourself out. Practicing the maneuvers we've talked about in the previous sections is easy enough, and you can do those on your own time as frequently as you want. When it comes to actually aiming and outgunning an opponent in ESF combat, it can seem very overwhelming when you constantly die to the same people over and over again. What you can do is ask someone who is more experienced than yourself, or even at the same skill level, to a one-on-one -on -one duel. These duels are what you might see pilots at the warp gate doing a lot, and this helps them practice immensely. Instead of dying in every engagement, you just go until one of you is on fire, repair, and then restart the duel again. This will allow you to get direct help from the other person and will allow them to tell you what you might be doing wrong and what you can improve. For those of you that wish to practice with someone else, here is how you can. First, you need to get your opponent in a squad with you. When you guys are pulling your ESFs, make sure you have the standard loadout that we talked about for air-to-air -air combat. In this format, use afterburners since you will be able to afterburn and reverse as much as you'd like. Then land somewhere near each other. Now press the page down key on your keyboard. That will bring up a menu that should look like this. Give your opponent access to your ESF by checking squad and platoon only. 
This will make it so that when you are engaging each other, you are shooting your own ESFs. That way the game will not register it as friendly fire. Now all you need to do is start the duel. To do this, fly up and outside the warp gate, and then turn and face each other. You will fly by and turn and face each other once your ESFs have passed each other. This will help you practice turning and facing your opponent. At that point, when both of you are facing each other, the duel starts. You will both fight until one of you gets the other on fire, or if one of you uses fire suppression. Repair your ESFs and repeat the process. Keep in mind that dueling is something that is completely different from infantry combat and tank combat. You and your opponent are both moving freely in three dimensions, and this can be really hard for some people to understand and get the grasp of. Practicing dueling is one of the best ways to get used to the mechanics and techniques we've talked about as well as aiming at another ESF at the same time. The main thing, I would say, that you have to worry about when it comes to ESF combat is the balance between aim and movement. I will talk about these both briefly, but please note that there is so much more to dogfighting than what I talk about in this video. You will learn a lot more from just the experience that you acquire as well as tips from other pilots that you might meet. I am only going to be talking about the balance between movement and aim solely for the purpose of making this video as short as I can, while trying to encompass most of the relevant things that newer pilots need to know when they start flying. So, when I talk about the balance between movement and aim, I will be using a specific example and slowing down the footage so you can see what I'm doing. Here it is. Right in the beginning of this clip you'll notice that I haven't spotted my opponent, and he has a clear advantage on me because of this and actually starts firing at me before I can fire at him. Watch how I move though. As you can see I'm using that number 2 method we talked about to get into hover because I deemed it inefficient to use the number 1 method, and I threw off my opponent's aim because of that. Now that my opponent has to adjust for my movement, I can essentially put the same amount of damage back onto him before he can re-engage me. Now that we're even, we are both using our ascend and descend keys to throw off each other's aim. Imagine trying to aim at an infantry player whose entire hitbox is moving up and down. It's basically like trying to aim at somebody that is strafing side to side as infantry. When we both need to reload here, this is when we both try to reposition, although the scythe doesn't do a good job of it. He ends up going out of hover and tries to slow down, but since he's not in hover, all he can do is move up and down, and that makes it easy to clean up. So, when you're trying to exchange fire with another ESF, the only practical thing to do is move up and down so that you can try to avoid shots. Repositioning in a duel is used better for when your opponent is reloading or repositioning. In a sense, it's kind of like infantry combat. When you exchange fire with someone else, the logical option is to strafe to try to avoid their fire. Same thing with ESFs, although you don't die as fast, which is why you get the chance to reposition. Staying in hover mode throughout the duel gives you a better chance of killing your opponent and surviving a one-on-one -on -one encounter. Kind of like how staying near cover as infantry gives you a better chance of surviving engagements. A quick thing to point out is that we were both at almost the same altitude for nearly the entire engagement. The reason for this, as discussed in the mechanics portion of the video, is that, due to gravity, you will either fall out of hover without a chance to reverse maneuver or reposition if you are looking down at your opponent, which this scythe did here, or you will be looking up at your opponent, which can disorient you from your own relation to the ground, and can also make it harder to track your opponent since you're just tracking them against the sky with no objects in view to tell you which way they're moving. I know it can be hard to go up against people that have been flying for over a thousand hours, because that's what I had to do as well, but trust me when I say that every engagement that you have with these people is a learning opportunity if you actually try to take something away from them, such as how could I have moved differently, or how could I have adjusted my aim to hit more shots. Ask the person that you've been having trouble with if you could have done something better as well. As I've said before, ask them to duel you, and if they accept, you can learn a lot more than just what I've said in this video, and especially more than what I've said during this dogfighting portion of the video. Repetition is key. Repeatedly trying to take everything we've talked about and apply it in a dogfight will eventually lead to muscle memory, which will also lead into you becoming a better pilot. I'm sorry this section was quite short, but as I've said before, you will learn a lot more by taking the initiative and putting yourself to the test. Just a quick thank you to everybody that watched this video. I know it's an extremely long video with a lot of stuff in it, mostly about mechanics, but it was intended to be this way. I wanted to make a video that encompasses the entirety of what newer pilots need to know should they decide to fly, and I think this video did just that. If you guys enjoyed the tutorial, be sure to share it with other people that may want to try to become a pilot in Planetside 2. 
It's a really fun experience that can be really rewarding when you get the hang of it, especially now that air alerts are a thing. For those of you that want to pursue piloting, I wish you the best, and good luck on learning how to fly. For all of you, thank you again for watching, and I'll try to think of another tutorial in the near future. Have a great day on Araxis, and I will see you on the battlefield.